Jordy. I caught you drinking a glass of water there, but uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Dave. Could you uh, just, just kick off this discussion by situating uh, for folks um, kind of the genesis of the project and how it fits with uh, the work that you folks have uh, had done previously that we were able to uh, collaborate on about this time last year? Sure. Uh, so the background of this project is um, Avicent, now Oliver Wyman, was awarded a Mines Grant in early 2022 uh, from the Department of National Defense. Um, and this in a lot of ways was a follow on to a similar project that we did the prior year, um, which I know you've spoken to one of my colleagues on in the past. Um, what this was really focused on is understanding and mapping the defense innovation ecosystem of Canada's Five Eyes allies, minus the United States, which is uh, was the subject of the report that we did in 2021. Um, you know, the real kind of idea of this um, report is really trying to answer a few kind of fundamental questions of, and to understand um, what defense innovation ecosystems really look like for the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, you know, these questions range from, you know, understanding what innovation really means to these um, stakeholders within each of these countries, um, you know, what's kind of the driver and the need to innovate, um, why they really, you know, need to even do this in the first place. Um, you know, what processes and strategies they're taking to improve their innovation outcomes. Uh, you know, what are some of the successes and challenges they experienced? And then, you know, fundamentally what this really means for Canada, you know, what are the opportunities and lessons learned that that Canada and um, stakeholders within Canada can take away from it? So that's, that's kind of the background of the project. So start a little bit just talking about some of the drivers. I mean, and if you can, if you can flesh out any of the, the differences or, or novelty between some of the other Five Eyes members uh, that you identified maybe and, and what uh, uh, you saw with uh, the United States. So I think what we... What we noticed were there were probably four or so kind of fundamental drivers that were common across all of the countries that we looked at. Um, you know, at, at the top of the list, and I think this is probably no surprise to anyone here that would be listening to this, um, is really the kind of geopolitical threat and environment that um, the Five Eyes community finds itself in today. Um, you know, I think the the threat from China, of course, you know, the risks of brinksmanship that we're seeing in the South China Sea um, and sort of in the, the APAC region um, as a whole um, is clearly, you know, a not yet a conflict, but something that represents a fundamental challenge to sort of the rules-based international order um, that we haven't seen since, since at least the Cold War period. Um, and then, of course, the threat from Russia in um, Eastern Europe, uh, which is put on full display in, in uh, the conflict in Ukraine right now. And I think that really demonstrates a, a need for innovation to, you know, stay apace the threat, um, you know, the kind of technological capabilities that are on display, probably more from China these days, um, based on kind of the performance of Russia in the Ukraine conflict, um, you know, represents uh, a real impetus for the United States and its allies to uh, maintain an innovative uh, posture towards technology and ensure that, you know, they, they maintain a, at least a qualitative edge. Um, the second main uh, driver here, I would say, would be the, the sort of budgetary environment that um, these countries find themselves in. Um, some of this has changed um, to a certain extent because of the aforementioned conflict in Ukraine, where you know, we're starting to see some, some accelerated growth, particularly in some of these countries like Australia and the UK. But kind of fundamentally, um, the budget environment is, is a really, really challenging one for all these countries to deal with, uh, mostly just because of the the kind of escalating costs that are coming from major capital programs, um, both on the acquisition side, you know, we see that with major programs and the way that, um, you know, the, the unit, the unit flyaway cost, for example, of a fifth generation fighter is, is uh, you know, far higher than what we saw in the past. Um, but I think this really comes down to the, the sustainment costs um, of more complex systems. And, you know, the more money that has to go towards, you know, operating and sustaining these uh, sort of capital equipment programs, means that there's less money to go towards, you know, the next innovation, the, the R&D that's really fundamental to staying, staying on top of the, uh, the threat. The third, um, you know, main driver that we witnessed across these countries is, is really this trend towards sort of industrial resiliency, we'd call it, um, you know, supply chain resilience, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, this, I think, especially in a post-COVID environment, um, the pandemic really brought into focus the need for you know, more surety of supply that we can't rely on um, just in time delivery for you know, the types of supply chains that supply the, uh, the militaries that make up the Five Eyes community. 
And what comes with that is also this, you know, very strong political motivation to um, sort of beef up the industrial bases within each of these countries. Um, industrial base jobs um, that are part of the defense industrial base are are good jobs, um, and they often reside in political communities that are that are uh, very important for for uh, the decision makers. So it's kind of a, a dual thread there, where um, you know innovation is a way to carve out sort of niches within the defense industrial base, um, allows countries to uh, you know grab a piece of a very valuable sector um, that is you know only growing with time. So if you're able to encourage innovation in areas like autonomy, AI, quantum technology, um, you can build up an industrial base that that is going to be valuable long term. And the final um, the final real driver that I think we saw was you know this whole idea of commercial technology itself being um, something that you need to grab onto. Um, you know I think we all know that the defense industry um, and the military itself used to be sort of the real driver for innovation in the past. Um, you know, it's, it's cliched at this point, but the internet GPS um, scores of technology that we use today in a you know, commercial um, and civil usage is really fundamentally a military technology at its base. Um, and I think we've seen that, you know, the script really get flipped in the last 30 years, um, since the end of the Cold War in particular, where um, you know, commercial industry has really overtaken defense industry and the military itself in being the drivers of innovation. Um, in one of the conversations that we had, I think somebody made an interesting point that Netflix's um, R&D budget is more than the entirety of the UK MOD's uh, R&D budget, which uh, for 2022 at least was true, um, which I think is a really, uh, really a, a staggering concept that you think of, you know, the types of tasks that Netflix is trying to carry out, um, you know, produce entertainment and deliver it versus, you know, the UK MOD, which is focused on trying to uh, protect a sovereign country, um, really puts it into stark reality that, you know, commercial technology is the future. And a lot of countries are recognizing that if you want to stay abreast of the technological advancements, you have to bring in commercial innovation. So thanks for sending the, the scene on the different drivers that uh, have precipitated um, what these countries are exploring. Um, can you talk a little bit about what exactly that uh, those innovation processes, what form do they take? Um, what are some of the different, uh, the generalizable um, uh, different uh, avenues that they're exploring? So I think um, when we when we first did the 2021 report, uh, when we thought about, you know, what it is that innovation really means, you know, has it manifest? Um, I think it came down to kind of three broad areas. Um, one was, of course, you know, the technologies itself, um, you know, looking at uh, either developing or, you know, integrating commercial technology into um, your military architecture. Um, the second was really around kind of organizations, you know, setting up new organizations in order to spur, um, you know, research and development or, you know, network, uh, you know, in order to spur innovation itself. Uh, and then finally, you know, was the sort of process improvements that made up innovation. So when we think about how how is it that uh, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand have been trying to innovate um, in their defense innovation ecosystems, you know, we kind of see it along those three lines. I think, um, you know, when it comes to the organizations we've seen about, I think we tracked just over 50 organizations across the three countries um, that, you know, in some way or form contribute to the defense innovation ecosystems. Um, and I think what was really staggering about that was how many of these organizations were founded in the last five to 10 years. Um, so it really shows, you know, that they're, that this is a, a problem that is um, recognized and is being acted upon now that, you know, 10 years ago, the landscape would have looked very different um, and much more sparse than it does today. On the processy side, um, you know, how innovation is actually, um, it actually manifests, comes in a few different forms. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to trying to streamline the procurement process, um, trying to make it you know, easier and faster for non-traditional firms to enter um, the procurement process. We all know the, the barriers that, um, that exist even for those that know how to navigate those spheres. So, you know, being able to um, speed up the, the time it takes is, is a, huge, uh, a huge part of the innovation effort. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of creative efforts being done to try to bring in kind of commercial venture capitalist type of mindset around, um, you know, seed funding for interesting ideas, you know, being able to 
get um, get non-traditional firms invested in the process and provide them with the type of liquidity that they need so that they can survive long enough to um, actually bring a solution to bear for the military. Um, you know, we've seen introduction of kind of these collaborative spaces. Um, a lot of the challenges, you know, for for new income, new incoming firms into the defense uh, industry, and frankly, even those that understand it is really being able to understand, you know, requirements and the who's who to talk to in order to make um, an acquisition a reality. Um, that's often really tough with the sort of hierarchical structure of a lot of government agencies. So being able to kind of break down those those cultural barriers by creating collaborative spaces where you can bring industry, academia, uh, defense officials together, you know, everyone takes off their their uniforms and they're just there to talk about, you know, what is the problem? How can we collaboratively work to solve it? That That's uh, that's one of the major areas. I think there's been a lot of success there. Um, and then I think finally, and this is a, an important point because I think it's sort of obvious, but I think it's become more important in the last few years is you know, really integrating academia into the process. Um, you know, based on some of the conversations that we had as part of this project, um, there's a real kind of cultural barrier that used to exist. And I think to a certain extent probably still does around um, academia within the, within the military. Um, so understanding, you know, the value that academia brings, especially when it comes to sort of the fundamental research that will eventually become the innovative solutions of the future. Um, it's really important to have them, you know, give them a seat at the table and make sure that they are part of the process. So could you talk a little bit about, so recognizing that you've got um, three countries with fairly divergent indus, uh, I guess, industries, uh, or government capacities, regional focuses, uh, et cetera. But talk a little bit about um, what areas um, that the innovation is being applied to. Are there any kind of common themes uh, across the three different countries that uh, we could look to from Ottawa or elsewhere in Canada as, as uh, an indicator of where these trends are going? Yeah, I mean, I think um, when it comes to common themes, I think we've seen, you know, I think the technology areas where all these countries are looking at are, are pretty uniform. Um, there's some variety, of course, as especially when we think about the the prior report on the United States, you know, the world that the US operates in, the DOD operates in, you know, a, an $800 uh, billion dollar plus defense budget environment just provides, you know, a, a breadth of opportunity that um, other countries can. But, you know, generally across the board, all countries are looking at the same sorts of technologies, you know, they're looking at space, they're looking at AI, autonomy, quantum technology, clean technologies. Um, where the relative emphasis is, though, obviously is a little different, you know, while the US may be looking at everything, and they're going deep on all of them. Um, some of the other countries are taking a little bit more of a tactical approach to certain things, you know, I think we've seen, um, you know, Australia is clearly an area where they're focusing, you know, big on autonomy, and I think already seeing some some successes there, um, you know, the UK space launch, um, quantum technology, things like that. New Zealand, obviously, they're going to be a little bit less, um, a little bit less focused in a lot of these areas, just because of the, the type of budget environment they're working in. So I think clean tech is one of the areas where they're trying to kind of punch above their weight. Um, I think when it comes to, you know, some of the common um, experiences that they're having, you know, beyond just the technology, um, I think we've seen a couple of, a couple of things that will hopefully be interesting for the Canadian community. Um, and I think fundamentally, a lot of it comes down to sort of how you define and measure um, innovation, because that's an area that I think a lot of countries, are, even as they are kind of going ahead with trying to make innovation happen, I think they maybe haven't thought through, um, or at least figured out exactly the right, um, right mix of how you define and measure innovation. So what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, defining innovation um, it was a question that we asked many of the stakeholders that we interviewed as part of this uh, part of this project, and what we found is that a lot of people, frankly, don't really know how to answer that. Um, you know, what is the definition of innovation in your view? You know, we got a lot of the same kind of answers around getting the capability in the hands of the warfighter, um, which I think is a great answer, um, if only because it's it's so mission focused. You know, it's really focused on what actually matters for winning the hypothetical conflicts of the future. Um, the problem is, is that it's such an amorphous definition that it often means that you're so focused on the outcome and really not focused enough on the process and how you get there. Um, so, you know, if you think about how you get a capability in the hands of the warfighter, are you really asking the questions around, you know, at what cost, um, you know, at what time frame and schedule, and of course, you know, what are the actual capabilities that the warfighter needs? These are not easy questions and they're not always obvious. Um, you know, you think about the 
the classic iron triangle of project management around you know costs, uh, schedule, and scope. You know, and you can't have all three all at the same time. Those are the same trade-offs that exist within the the defense acquisition community. And I don't know if there's a um, there has really been enough thought on exactly how you figure out the compromises that need to be made across each of those three elements of the triangle. When it comes to measuring success, that's another area that um, I think we've seen some kind of common common challenges and common thoughts around there from everyone that we spoke to. Um, you know, a lot of it really comes down from a high level view from uh, the various ministries of defense on you know what those technology priorities are. Some of the ones I mentioned earlier. Um, but how that actually links to individual organizations, you know, key performance indicators and other measures of success um, is often hard to really figure out. Um, you know, what we often see is the KPIs of an individual organization are focused on, you know, um, the number of engagements you have with industry or the number of grants that are um, awarded to, you know, small and medium enterprises. However, the linkage to that higher level strategy is often sort of lost in the process. Um, it's not always clear exactly how the individual efforts are rolling up into those broader priorities. So I think there's sort of a, some sort of middle ground there that needs to be developed in order to link kind of the high level politically directed um, priorities with the actual actions on the ground. To switch gears a little bit to, to focus on uh, kind of a Canadian nexus with this um, and the report you talk on some of the, the identifying some of the, the different opportunities for Canadian involvement in what our allies are doing. Uh, could you flesh that out a little bit for us? Uh, sure. So I think on the Canadian side, there's a few different um, a few different opportunity areas that should be you know thought about a little bit. Um, one is, again, the kind of technological um the technology priorities of each of these countries and you know how that links to canada um I, I think as i mentioned earlier you know i think the areas that canada's um dnd is focused on you know a lot of ways there's a lot of overlap with what other countries are focusing on um and i think it also benefits that you know some of these areas are areas where canada i think has some differentiated capabilities um, you think about maritime domain awareness um you know quantum technology you know areas where where Canada really is a leader um, in certain subsets. Um, and what that means is that there's, I think, a lot of opportunity for potential collaboration. Um, I think what we've seen from each of these countries whenever we talk to them, at least you know, from sort of the working level people, you know, the, the director level types of people at each of these organizations, um, they're always very eager to want more of Canada. Um, there's clearly you know, a real appetite for greater cooperation, understanding what it is that Canada does and what they can do, um, and you know, making sure that those linkages exist. Um, I think we've seen it in, you know, in subsets. Um, I think you know, naval cooperation, for example, and you know, all the technology that surrounds that is an area where there's a lot of cooperation with both the UK and Australia, and to a lesser extent, New Zealand. Um, but I think some other areas, you know, are the links are not as strong, um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to develop that at a you know political level at a government to government level, but also at, a, at an industry level. Um, and I think Canada really benefits from, you know, some of the, the key trends that are going on, um, you know, both at a multi-level level, multi -lateral, multi -lateral level, but also at the national level of each of these individual countries, um, you know, beyond the technological um, similarities and what everyone's, you know, sort of prioritizing. You know, I think there's this clear trend towards sort of friend shoring, um, you know, both within the, the US looking towards other allies to integrate into their kind of broader um, industrial base. But I think other countries are generally speaking becoming more interested in um, you know, a wider industrial base that they can plug into and that they can source from um, just because of some of those budgetary pressures and some of that you know, focus on getting the best in breed technology means that you can't always go to the same suppliers every time. You need to be willing to look abroad. And I think um, there's potentially areas where Canada can be part of that solution. The flip side of all of that, um, and I think some of the challenges that Canada might face in, in trying to take advantage of that opportunity is that, um, you know, I think fundamentally Canada's industrial base is, um, is you know, largely focused on landed primes, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it can lead to issues around sort of IP ownership and, you know, who does the R&D, um, and you know, ensuring that Canada is the 
the uh, originator for exports. Um, that's a that's a complex situation, and one that I think is is challenging for Canada to kind of be a, an export lead as a result. Um, you know, additionally, a lot of the actual exports that are done now is a lot of platform focused exports, um, which again is a high value area, but it's not necessarily the area that will kind of drive the technological innovations of the future. Um, so understanding you know, where it is that the platform exports can be integrated with some of those other innovative solutions is uh, clearly important. And I think the, the last one this is more kind of a political angle, but you know, there's sort of some mixing signals and exactly where Canada's focus lies when it comes to engaging with allies. There's clearly kind of a, a willingness and interest in wanting deeper relationships with a lot of Canada's close allies like the UK, Australia, New Zealand, the US. Um, but it's it's not quite clear exactly what form that wants to take, especially with you know, sort of the the AUKUS um, trend in the background is clearly something that's going to drive a lot of a lot of the political thinking. Um, but also, you know, if there will be sort of the budgetary environment to support um, a deeper uh, a deeper kind of more integrated Canadian involvement in the Five Eyes innovation, you know, information sharing um, architecture, if one were to exist. Well, thanks for the for that overview. Um, we're going to start opening things up to, for questions here. So if uh, you want to ask something, um, raise your hand uh, on the on the Zoom function or, or pop something into the chat, and I'll I'll build a list. Um, and while folks are are marshalling uh, those, um, I've got a, a couple things just to ask you to expand on a little bit more. So and you kind of touched on a couple there. So one is um, related to the international cooperative angle. So as you're looking at um, now the other countries in the, the Five Eyes holistically, how much of their efforts um, do you see as being uh, national um, versus collaborative, multilateral? You, you touched on AUKUS and obviously there's a trend there, but um, so how much do the countries put their weight of emphasis between the various forums that exist, say, across the different Five Eyes, uh, holistically, the Air Force to Air Force uh, um, relationships, the R&D communities relationship across the countries versus national specific uh, initiatives? And what's kind of the balance between doing things uh, in-house independently versus collaboratively with within that close uh, Five Eyes framework? I think you know, if I were to speak generally, I would say that the majority of it is definitely still at the, the national and frankly, subnational level. Um, one of the things that's interesting about countries like Australia and the UK is um, particularly Australia is the, you know, really heavy focus on state level um, initiatives and a lot of kind of the national frameworks that are developed there are often about um, kind of piggybacking on things that are being done at a state level that eventually evolve into a national level initiative. Um, I think on the the international side, it's still definitely a work in progress. I think in breaking down some of the barriers. I think a lot of the a lot of the interactions are still kind of on a case file by case file base. Um, you know, stovepipe by services. I think it's it's definitely there from the folks that we talk to. Um, you know, again, like naval, um, the naval um, cooperation that happens between uh, Australia, the UK, Canada, and other allies. It was really strong, but it's just focused on the naval uh, aspect. I think the broader kind of information sharing and innovation sharing, um, yes, that happens on the ground in sort of the larger, um, you know, war games and similar kind of multilateral operations that happen, especially in the more and more in the Indo PACOM um, environment. But I think that the a lot of the international cooperation continues to be sort of narrowly focused on certain things. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think there's a lot of really great research um, that happens. You know, I think the, the UK and Canada, for example, has a number of programs and grants that happen between, I think it's the NRC um, and equivalents in the UK that you know are focused on collaborating between Canadian academia and British industry or British academia and uh, Canadian industry. And I think that's a great way to build some of the smaller informal ties, you know, at the sub national level. Um, but when it comes to the, the big international cooperations, you know, I think there isn't, there isn't yet the big venues for these types of issues to be fleshed out beyond AUKUS, which I think is a special case, happy to talk about that. But I think that's, that's kind of the big, um, you know, 600 pound gorilla in the room right now in these conversations, because it is starting to, I think, suck up a lot of the air when it comes to, you know, what does a international multilateral um, innovation sharing sphere look like? 
So maybe a slightly different weight class, but another gorilla in the room on this is adoption. Uh, so I've got a couple of questions sent to me directly already, um, asking you to just talk a little bit about different approaches to adoption. So not just innovation and creation, but how do how do national governments, members of an alliance, actually obtain either through a procurement mechanism or through a MOU or whatever the whatever the means of obtaining the innovation? Um, can you offer any perspective about different approaches? to actually adopting the innovation uh, and what lessons that Canada might uh, take away from that? So I think um, the thing that came up so often, this was a question that we asked um, in a lot of the interviews that we conducted was, and I think it's, a, it's related, it's the whole question of sort of the valley of death. Um, it's a relatively easy problem and obviously relatively from a, a layman's perspective um, to do sort of the research and development side of things. Um, you know, you think about the TRL scale, the technology ready, readiness level scale that um, is commonly applied in these situations. You know, the, everything that's kind of in the TRL up to maybe TRL six, um, you know, once you're starting to get into prototyping all that is relatively quote unquote easy to do. Um, it's something that the defense innovation ecosystem, um, the kind of military itself has been very good at doing for a long time. But where the challenge really comes in is you know, how do you get something from, okay, you developed a prototype, maybe you're starting to test it to widespread adoption across, um, across the customer base. And that is something that I think everyone is still trying to figure out. Um, I think where there have been some successes is in developing the processes in order to allow for um, uh, kind of de-risking and buy-in from the defense community. What I mean by that is that what often happens is that there are organizations that help fund research and then help fund a prototype and testing. And there isn't a natural handoff that happens to the acquisition community. Uh, that's often a completely different customer community, one that's not, not often kind of plugged into what's happening in the R&D community. Um, and where there's, we've seen some successes is organizations that have been really good at helping to facilitate that handoff. They bring in folks from the contracting community and kind of play a little bit of a matchmaking role. Um, you know, they identify who are the people that have the challenges in the contracting community. You know, they've identified an issue that the warfighter is facing and they're thinking about how do we get the, uh, the correct solution in their hands. Having a matchmaker that is able to find that person and then match that up to the solution that's being developed but doesn't have kind of that natural handoff. That's where you start to see a lot of a lot of the success. Um, and I think in Canada, that's an area where there's some interesting things that are happening. I think the Ideas Program is one that um, D and D has put a lot of emphasis on. And I think you know it's probably still too early to say how successful it's been, but I think it's going in the right direction. Um, you know, focusing not just on being able to uh, develop the technology and do the research and do the hard science that's involved there, but how do you actually get it into the hands of the warfighter? You know, how do you how do you focus on um, you know moving that along the chain? Is I think where there's a lot of work still to be done. Um, but I'm encouraged by some of the signs I've seen in other countries. So if we can use that comment as a as a segue back to some of the comments you're making earlier about um, measurement. I guess, are there um, observations that Canada could draw from that? So I guess one would be, so you just mentioned sort of the time scale, like any kind of lesson to draw about like what is an appropriate um, length of time to be able to reflect on the, a program and, and, and then come back and, and judge its success or failure. You know, so ideas was one of the first initiatives from the 2017 uh, defense policy to really get out and to get uh, operating. So that's, it's not just been six years, but it's been six years of time passed and they were actually pretty quick to, to start on that, at least relative to a lot of other initiatives. So if six years isn't necessarily long enough, can you draw anything about like, what is the appropriate amount of time or best best practice to, to use to reflect back on, on that? And I guess the other comment would be sort of stitch together a couple of, of things that you mentioned there. Um, so on one hand, if you've got, um, uh, a difficulty with everybody having the same challenge about uh, valley of death. Um, are there other particular uh, particular approaches to measurement um, that can or should be used? So 
you know, kind of the instinctive question is whether or not there's some measurement processes that are more outcome focused rather than process focused. But if everybody's got the, the same kind of general problem about adoption, then that's, I guess, presumably sort of skews the bit of the emphasis on, on how you measure outcome. So is there a, a different way to reflect on uh, best practices and getting meaningful measurement? If everybody's I guess to use to rephrase what you said slightly if everybody's dealing with the same issue about adoption getting it into the hands of somebody that needs to use it is there another type of outcome uh, that you can look at that isn't just you know number of grants issued uh, and those types of more process metrics so on your first question around time scale um i think it's it's a challenging one to figure out especially because it varies country by country um you know one of the things that we thought a little bit about is with each of these countries, um, you know, setting aside the U.S., they're often kind of they're often acting as second movers um, when it comes to technology development. Um, you know, we we did a little bit of case study on counter UAS, um, and it's an area where you know I think the the United States has been working on that problem for you know quite some time. They identified it um, you know more than a decade ago and have been working towards solutions and. Um, you know, countries like Australia and the UK have been a little bit slower to come to that conclusion and, you know, put real money and investment behind that, but they've been able to come to solutions and start fielding them, um, in a faster time frame than the U S and that's partly because, um, you know, if I were to hazard a guess is because, you know, some of those technology barriers, um, were broken by the U S, um, and sort of the, you know, arsenal funding that they have access to incentivizes industry to start working on these problems sooner. And then by the time the second mover countries start looking at the same problems, there's already solutions that are at least in development, if not already fielding. Um, and so it allows, you know, I think countries like Canada and Australia and the UK, and frankly, those, anyone that basically isn't the United States, um, to think about innovation in a slightly different way. I think there's clearly a need to still be very ambitious in how you think about timelines um, and also be ambitious about trying to be a first mover when you can, you know, carving out the niche where, you know, Canada, for example, can be a, a leader in quantum technology, I think is a great example where I think that that really holds true. But you can't do everything um, unless you're the US and even the US probably can't do everything um, as the first mover. So are there ways that you can figure out the technologies that you really want to focus on and you know, invest kind of a long-term R&D strategy towards, you, know, you're, you may not see the outcome for 10 to 15 years um, because you're starting really at point zero on this. And are there other areas where you're willing to be the second mover? Um, and that allows you to, I think, shorten the time scale pretty significantly. So I don't have a great answer in terms of the actual number of months or years um, from where you, you know, start the process to where you start seeing the results you want. But I think that you can look at the problem in different ways, depending on where you're able to compromise in terms of how urgent the solution is that you require. Um, I'll probably need a, a refresher on what the second part of your question is, Dave, though. Yeah, and that very long-winded piece about uh, how do you how do you do better outcome measurement, recognizing that getting to the genuine outcome of, of innovation adoption was presumably the objective of all of these programs. But if everybody's facing a similar challenge about bridging the valley of death, are there any any takeaways about better or worse approaches to doing um, measurement of these different programs that aren't just looking at sort of process metrics that governments inherently tend to tend to devolve to? Yeah, that, that really is the question. Um, and I think a challenge that is pretty fundamental. We've seen, you know, a lot of conversations that we had, this common theme that kept coming up around, um, you know, what is sort of the risk appetite of, of governments? And I think um, there's often, frankly, there, the appetite is often fairly low. Um, you know, the, the focus on metrics, the focus on oversight and governance, which are all extremely important and are there for a good reason often means that um, those that have to run the program are often, you know, focused on meeting the KPIs that are in front of them in order to, you know, pass the governance checks that they, um, that they live by. And that often means that they're disincentivized from taking some of those riskier bets, um, because by its very nature, a lot of the really innovative technology won't necessarily have a um, successful outcome at all. Uh, and if it does, it might be many years before you really start to see success, um, or at least signs of success. 
So as a result, you're going to focus on, you know, more of the sure bets that allow you to, you know, show success that show um, the types of KPIs that you need. And I think it really comes down to at least for a certain subset of organizations um, and maybe technologies as well is, you know, have, building sort of a different culture around that. Um, I don't know if there's specific KPIs that you would put in instead of the ones that are there right now. I think it's more of a fundamental uh, cultural issue where you need to set up organizations that have a certain amount of autonomy from um, those governance structures. Not that there shouldn't be any governance at all, of course, um, but that you need to be willing to you know, invest money and take risks where you're not necessarily going to see an outcome right away. Um, and I think a lot of organizations that have been founded, you know, kind of similar to the crown corporation type of style that we have in Canada, um, you know, ones that have a certain arm's length uh, distance from government, you know, allows them to stay connected enough that they are, they understand what the requirements are and what it is that the solutions that the MOD or whoever is looking to acquire, but still enough distance that they're able to develop their own sort of innovative culture, um, you know, that they can take a longer, a longer view towards developing the solutions that are needed. I think that's really what it comes down to. Um, there are individual KPIs that I'm sure flow from that, but I think a lot of it is really about sort of baselining a different culture. Okay. Uh, well, Jordy, thanks for joining us today to, to share the findings uh, from the report. Uh, folks can stay tuned to uh, the paper that you uh, people are in the process of finalizing up that we'll be publishing shortly uh, and continue to look for uh, more work that you people do in this area. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining uh, and to the Minds program at DND for supporting the work and to our strategic sponsors, Lockheed Martin Canada, General Dynamics, and Irving Shipyard uh, for helping us put this on.